there, Commanders. I made a mistake in my previous video, so this is going to be a redo of the video that I released last night, uh, just with the mistake corrected. If you've already seen the previous video, you get the gist of it, but the mistake that I made was that as I was laying out the optionals, I forgot to put a planetary vehicle hanger in. So, I've replaced the Research Olympic controller with the planetary vehicle hanger, and the rest of this video will be me just going over the build again in case anyone new stumbles along and wants to see it. So, uh, from the top, the Crate Phantom is one of the best medium ships in the game. It is extremely versatile and adaptable. While it's not going to draw any good marks in combat, it is possible to build combat builds, though they're more of a niche thing. A couple of, I think, stealth ships have been attempted with this, but the Crate Phantom is mostly used for exploration purposes, and it excels at them, even to the point where it is the better option over some of the large ships, depending on what kind of exploration you're doing and how often you plan to visit things like surface sites. I suspect that the new auto land function we're receiving with Odyssey is going to change that dynamic, but at least for the next month or two, the Crate Phantom is going to remain an extremely powerful choice, and even following Odyssey, one of the best exploration ships that you can go for in the game. If you are a part-time explorer or even a core explorer, I know people who have gone on really long expeditions using the Crate Phantom and have no intentions of upgrading to something like an Anaconda because this guy suits almost all of their purposes. I do plan on going over some of the large builds in the coming weeks, but for now, um, I'll just stick to the Phantom. Core internals on all exploration ships will follow the same logic, which is lightweight alloy, heavy duty grade 5 deep plating. This gets you the, a pretty good amount of absolute hull to start with and a little bit more survivability if you get caught with your shields down in a collision or something. The Crate Phantom does offer a lot more flexibility for power plant configuration. I use a 4A power plant, but you can go larger or even one size smaller and still be able to power almost all of your add-ons really well. But going smaller doesn't save you that much weight. Six tons is not that bad for jump range sacrifice, and when you pair it with low emissions, grade 5, and thermal spread, you get a really, really reliable cold running reactor that will allow you to scoop and stick around hot environments almost indefinitely. So you don't have to worry about cooking around stars and can endure a lot more punishment than you would be able to otherwise. Core internals for explorers usually like D-rated thrusters. There are exceptions to this rule and if you're willing to upsize the power plant you can get enough energy flexibility to put A-rated thrusters on here. But, D-rated thrusters give you the best jump range, and the smallest sized module that the ship can equip, in this case a size 4 thruster, is the is, is what I've decided to go with. I don't think that the game... yeah, you can't get away with anything smaller than a 4E or a 4D. So, 4D is the lightweight guy, and one of the misnomers in this game about lightweighting thrusters is that it makes it impossible to escape high G worlds. I've talked about this in previous videos, but that's not true. 4D thrusters can totally escape a 9, 10, 12G planet. The game will buff thruster output to ensure that you always have enough power to escape. But it will penalize you in the amount of heat that your thrusters produce in order to do so. In this situation with dirty grade 5 and drag drives, you do want to make sure that you have a heatsink launcher on because uh, even these smaller thrusters will overheat your ship as you try to escape. So you'll need a couple of pops to be able to get away. 5A, Tech Broker Frameshift Drive. If you're doing exploration and your ship takes a 5A Frameshift Drive slot, that is your best bet. You can use regular engineering if you want to, but it's worth the materials grind even at the increased price that this module is currently going for. It gives you a beautiful amount of jump range that gets you just a hair short of what the Anaconda can jump. 4D, Life Support System to save weight. You can also go in and lightweight this, which I recommend. But if you're planning on doing neutron highways and you're worried about cockpit blowouts, you can go with a larger life support system. 3D, power distributor. Engine focus grade 5 with super conduits. This gives you the ability to boost and also gives you enough power to run the pulse laser to proc a guardian beacon. 6D sensors, lightweight grade 5 to preserve jump range and power consumption. The 5C fuel tank is untouched. I don't typically recommend people shrink the fuel tank size in exploration ships and there are even some situations as we get into larger ships where I'll recommend that you add fuel capacity. But, we'll get into that later. 6A, fuel scoop. You can get away with a 6B on this build. 
It doesn't cost you too much scoop time, and if you do have the 4A power plant with low emissions, then you'll get a little bit better power performance down here, not by much. What this saves you is cost in the door, for the most part. Because the difference between the A and the B amounts to about 1% power. Uh, but the A-rated fuel scoop is incredibly expensive, so if you're on a budget, the B-rated can, can work if you need it to. 5H Guardian Frameshift Drive Booster for 10.5 extra light years of jump range. I recommend on most exploration builds that you put the largest Guardian Frameshift Drive Booster you can stick in without compromising the fuel scoop. If you have to pick between one or the other, it's typically better to have the fuel scoop be in the larger module. But since you don't have a size 6 Guardian Frameshift Drive Booster, the uh, Crate Phantom does not require you to make that sacrifice. Uh, I just accidentally bumped the delete button stick that back in. 5D shield generator. This can be swapped out for another module of your choice if you prefer to run shieldless. We're getting to a level where shieldless starts to be a thing. Um, it's easier to run shieldless on larger ships because you can get more absolute hull to start with, but occasionally I run into people who run shieldless crate phantoms. If you do want to run shields, the D-rated shield is plenty for most purposes. Enhanced low power grade 5 and low draw to get the weight and power consumption down. 5A Auto Field Maintenance Unit. In most exploration environments, I recommend running a larger AFM because it gives you more ammo capacity. And A-rated is best. There's a myth going around that B-rated is better because it's got more ammo. However, if you'll note here, uh, the Coriolis interface gives you feedback on how much repair that a module can perform when you're looking at AFMs. The 5A AFM has a 187.6 repair capacity. If I go over to the 5B, it drops to 167.9, even though the ammo increases. This is because if you look at its stats, every AFM has a repair efficiency rating. The higher that number, not only the faster does the AFM repair, but the less repair kits it needs per unit of repair in order to operate. 5A remains the standard for the best performance in exploration. If you are on a budget and you want to make power sacrifices, you can do so. But note that because we're running a 4A power plant, the AFM can't be on all the time. It needs to be disabled in your module screen, or you're going to not be able to do anything. It will paralyze your ship. 3E cargo rack. Having a little cargo capacity in exploration ships is always a good thing. It allows you to scoop Guardian resources if you're running a Guardian site, and to collect other rare commodities that can occasionally pop up as you are running around in the black. It also gives you limpet storage to allow your repair limpet controller to do its job. This is a D-rated controller, which I also have powered down by default, since you don't usually need a repair limpet controller anyway. This is a good redundancy. Between the shield generator and the repair limpet controller and the AFM, you have all of the resources to remain out in the galaxy almost indefinitely with plenty of mistake forgiveness, as long as you don't boost into the surface of a high G world or something like that. Here's where the mistake was originally. I had a research limpet controller in here because I totally spaced the planetary vehicle hanger. But if you have to make a choice between the two, the planetary vehicle hanger is better because it allows you to access and research surface sites, and I believe it will be essential in Odyssey. This was an oversight on my part, and thank you to the viewers in the comments who called this out. I don't like misleading people, and I don't definitely don't like uh, making mistakes like that, so I'm going to try to guard against it a little bit better in the future. Super Cruise Assist is a valuable tool for scouting binaries. It basically lets your ship behave like an apex taxi. You're going to love this thing if you have to explore binaries that are 100,000 light seconds away because it at least lets you go and do something else or watch your, I don't know, watch South Park on another monitor or something. Detailed Surface Scanner. This guy is nice and essential. It's required equipment for most situations. I recommend getting the engineering blueprint for it because it makes it a lot easier to hit your efficiency targets when you're doing surface scans. There is a CG version of this module floating around if you happen to have it. Go ahead and stick it on here because it will let you scan bodies that require six probes with just two. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I really, really hope the tech broker gets it sometime soon because it will make things really nice for especially uh, dealing with large systems with lots of uh, higher mass bodies that you have to scan. 2F pulse laser with lightweight grade 5 and flow control to keep the power draw as confined as possible while also allowing the weight to be reduced. A viewer did ask me in the previous version of the video before I enlisted it if it would be better to stick a mining lance in here. 
that's your call. The Mining Lance's one advantage in exploration is that it can act as an energy weapon if you need it to, meaning that it can be used to destroy sentinels at Guardian sites, but it comes with a huge disadvantage of being unengineerable and weighing a lot more than this is going to weigh. So it will have a jump range cost and a higher energy cost. If you're willing to make that sacrifice, then feel free, but I think that the 2F Pulse Laser is adequate for most purposes, and if you have an SRV bay, you can get all of the synthesis materials you need from planet surfaces rather than scraping it from an asteroid or something. Heat sink launcher and point defense. The heat sink launcher, as I mentioned, is to help you deal with thrusters and the possibility of inadvertent overheats in other situations. Uh, it is lightweight grade 5. A point defense for guardian ruins, lightweight grade 5. These two modules are entirely optional. I've had a couple of criticisms pop up in the comments for the previous video. Uh, so I will reiterate that these are completely optional modules. You do not have to stick these on your ship. They are here because I have noticed a lot of explorers in the game that I have interacted with like to have them. But, as it stands right now, they don't directly trigger gameplay events. The Frameshift Wake Scanner can agitate certain biological sources at different sites that you might find in Lagrange clouds. But that's about it. You don't get any sensor data from scanning biologicals, you just get them to react. And any scanner will do that. The Xeno scanner can do it too. Uh, and then a couple of explorers that I know in canon like to have the Xeno scanner on board in case they encounter Thargoids or other Thargoid related content. But there isn't any I'm aware of outside of what has already been exposed. And if you try to get a Xeno scan on a Thargoid in an exploration ship, and I mean like an interceptor, you're probably going to die. They, they, don't, they don't like that very much. So, uh, the total cost is 87 mil, which makes it a reasonably expensive ship. You can grind this out in 10 or so hours if you're just talking about credit value, with a 4.3 million credit rebuy. So, it's not expensive in terms of what's possible with any combat ship, really. But, the engineering that has to go into this is significant. So, you need to have most, if not all, of the engineers unlocked to be able to get this all the way up to its peak performance. For that reason, I consider this to be an intermediate level build. So if you haven't built an exploration ship yet, I actually recommend you try to build the Diamondback first because it will give you comparable jump performance and travel times without needing to invest as heavily in resources like the Crate Phantom will require you to do. And if you think that the Crate Phantom is tough, ooh, man, we still got the Anaconda and the Beluga in this series. And if you guys want me to review any other exploration ships, let me know in the comments. So uh, I will catch you later.